Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Inga Cotton. I'm the founder and executive director of San Antonio Charter Moms. And these are Charter Moms Chats. And uh, we've been going live on weekdays to talk about things that families need to know, um, you know, during this time of uh, distance learning and at-home learning. And uh, over the summer, we featured lots of activities that families can do at home to keep the learning going, uh, including uh, our guest today, who's uh, back, Chef Dave Terrazas of the Foodie Classroom. And over the summer, he was he came on a, right just before Fourth of July with some great summer recipes, and uh, and now he's back with a how to make a spooky snack board. Um, and I would encourage you to look in the description for a link to uh, a blog post, and it's got links to recipes and a list, a shopping list, and equipment list, and things like that. So I encourage you to do these recipes at home with your kids. You can do it for Halloween. It's healthy. It's fun. And uh, yeah, we've got, Chef Dave has all the details, but he's here to um, talk about the foodie classroom and demonstrate some of these uh, recipes with us. So, and then I want to tell you just a little bit about um, Chef Dave. So he has a really interesting background. He actually worked in national security before becoming a chef. And uh, you would think, wow, that's really a big shift. But when you get him talking, you realize like they are inextricably intertwined that like our the well-being of our families and our society rests so much on food and healthy eating and sustainability. So, um, okay, Chef, Chef Dave, did I, did I do a good job explaining that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. But no, but seriously, tell us more about the, like, like sort of your vision. And I know like you, you worked at the Botanical Garden, you know, teaching, you know, kids, getting kids excited about healthy food and about growing their own food. And uh, you worked yeah. at a private school uh, where you developed a lot of these, um, Things for the foodie classroom. Um, so, I mean, how do you see that interconnection between um, your work in national security and like like food security and stability and um, you know our our well being and what we eat? Well, um, well, thanks for having me back. First of all, um, yeah, it was kind of um, uh, it's not something I I expected. I, I I told you last time I think that I grew up in a Mexican and Chinese and Mexican American family in El Paso, Texas, and uh, from the get-go, just multicultural family that cooked a lot, and um, that was a, something that we valued tremendously. Um, I go in the Air Force, of course, and I travel all around the world. And you know, in the process of traveling, I think because I grew up in such a family that, that values uh, those customs and traditions that that we thought made us rich as a family. Um, you know, I would uh, take interest in other cultures. They, you know, with, in the host countries that I was traveling to. I remember one time I was in Turkey and I went with a couple of uh, buddies of mine into town. And we left the base, went into town, and we were just going for dinner, you know, after the work day. And we met up with this, uh, we met this uh, family who was, they were like a, a rug, they sold rugs. And I don't know, we just, we started hanging out with them. We kept coming back to visit them. And one day they actually invited us to a wedding, a cousin's wedding. So we go, just three guys. Oh, yeah, and then and before I know it, the bride and the groom have a circle of people around us dancing around us, and I'm thinking, it's your wedding. Why, what are you doing? We're just happy to be here. But uh, what I found is that the, uh, the more often I took an interest in the cultures of the people that I visited, the more uh, excited they were to be able to express that. And it gave me access to a lot of things that I wouldn't have otherwise, including kitchens. And so I just became kind of a gastronome as a, as a result. And um, 10 years ago this month, Inga, 10 years ago, I became a chef. So I was taking a sabbatical. It was really just a sabbatical. I went to culinary school with the last of my GI Bill money. And uh, I just kind of found that I really liked it. And I was a little bit older when I went into the workforce. I mean, I graduated from culinary school at 39 years old. And a couple of years later, I ended up taking um, a job at a private school. Um, and it was a scratch-based cooking job. They, they didn't want to do the, the thaw, bake, and serve kind of deal, you know, that some, uh, some districts can do in the public school system, and they wanted me to cook. Well, it was a great opportunity, and the same faculty embraced me, and they had a 1,500-square-foot raised bed garden outside. And interestingly enough, the teacher who was running that did not come back um, one year, and so nobody wanted to take the garden. So I asked the headmaster, and I said, hey, can I? Can I have it? <laughs> and he said, as long as you make it look good for our prospective parents, yes, of course. And I said, you know, I would actually like to integrate this 
Now, it worked for us because we didn't have uh, an affordable school lunch program. We weren't subsidized by USDA. And that frees you up a little bit to incorporate food from campus gardens into lunch programs, unless you're willing to. There's a lot you have to go through with USDA to make sure, and rightly so. You want to be in compliance when it comes down to food safety and food service. But, you know, it let us work with curriculum. And this was uh, 2013. And then by 2014, I had this idea for something called Foodie Classroom. And what I noticed is that I got a lot of complaints from parents, but not because of the food quality. They complained to me because we didn't have an affordable school lunch program that was subsidized that brought the lunch down to two something, you know, per lunch. And their kids wanted to eat every day. And they said, Dave, Chef Dave, we're already paying for tuition. We can't afford lunch, school lunches every day, you know? You're, and I had no control over pricing. But the, what they were saying was, we value, and our child seems to value the food you're creating that's fresh and healthy. And we like that. And we want to know what you're doing. So I created this blog called the uh, Foodie Classroom. And I actually left it up there. You can actually visit it to this day, foodieclassroom.wordpress.com. And it was just a little blog that I ran with some interns that I had from Texas a and University because my school was right next door. And I essentially communicated with parents, faculty members and staff, and the kids themselves what we were putting on the menu and why. And the more I started doing this and doing activities in the garden, allowing the teachers to come into the garden, the more I found myself integrating with the actual curriculum itself. And so I had this idea, what if you could actually teach K through 12 curriculum but you use food as a contextual piece, you know, to kind of say, oh, this is how I would use it in the world. And the idea was to kind of uh, draw people, draw kids to pursue career paths, starting with college, um, in fields that I thought were necessary, like agriculture, horticulture, culinary arts, bioenvironmental bio science, public health, and communications. And I had interns, I served as a preceptor um, at the private school and again at the botanical garden, uh, for these students, and they all learn from each other, and I learn from them. And the value proposition was, if you come intern with me, I will teach you culinary skill set that might make you more marketable when you enter the career field of your choice. And it just was a win-win for everybody, and we were able to do great work, and I brought that to the botanical garden when you and I met, and, you know, the rest is history. So turning that into a much bigger project that goes live on November 1st, and we're just going to take videos. Um, yeah, now it's called the foodie cla oh, foodieclassroom.com. Thank you for putting that up. And we'll go live and we're just going to teach. Uh, at the beginning, we're going to put up videos that are high school level. And so we're going to be talking to, well, actually, now they go down to the middle school with Algebra 1, Geometry, uh, Biology, Chemistry, and Physics. So I'm going to start with those five. And we're just going to go through the curriculum the schools go through throughout the year. And we'll create videos using food. And then we'll add recipes to the end of that you know, using the food that was in lessons. So that's what we're doing. I'm super excited about that. I, I want to mention that uh, for folks, okay, so um, if you, if anyone clicks on the link in the description of the video, that takes you to, you know, the, today's recipes, right? The spooky, spooky snack board. But it, that post also has links to the post you did back in July, which has, was really rich with the like STEM education stuff, right? So like you talk about like the, you know, a pizza is a circle. How do you, you know, like there's, yeah. you know, the geometry formulas, right, to understand that. And then there's the the great, like the taste bud activity, which I think is like so fundamental. And it's fun for kids at any age. And it, it gets them thinking about how recipes are designed, right, to have those contrasting flavors and how it impacts your tongue. And um, I mean, that's, 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 a, that's an ageless, timeless activity. So those are, you know, I feel like those are evergreen, like the things you know, from Foodie Question that you shared with us in the summer. Um, and the, um, you know, the October post and the July post both have links to the the blog, the foodie classroom wordpress.com blog that you did back in the day. So it's, you know, it's all, it's all interconnected. I just, I encourage people to like, you know, go in and click on the links and keep, you know, keep exploring. Cause like, there's just so much richness to this, you know, it's this vision you have of like, you know, it's not just like, you know, a few recipes, but it extends into all these other areas of the curriculum. And, and then it makes those, the math and the science more fun because, you get to eat too, right? And you get to <laughs> get to use sharp <laughs> knives. And <laughs> Absolutely. You, you see how everything truly is connected. And, you know, I have to say there are uh, several charter systems in San Antonio that actually embrace this. I, I know like uh, IDEA would be one of those where you have the campus gardens and they do their best to use them as outdoor classrooms. I think that's an amazing thing that's happening in San Antonio. And, you know, there are great um, entities 
uh, organizations within the city that are also serving as sort of connecting points between schools and others, you know, uh, that are doing this. Of course, the Texas AgriLife Extension Service, A&M AgriLife Extension Service is great, Echo Central, you know, there are other entities that are doing similar things just to kind of help us all see just how interconnected everything really is, you know? Right. Uh, and it's wonderful. I'm glad you brought up the tape, but I do have a little cutting board here with that uh, demonstration. If we can do a little recap of that. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Cause it's, it's like, it's so fun and it's like good for every age. So yeah, let's go ahead and do the, let's do the taste bed activity. That's a lot of fun. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, um, and this is kind of like pulling the curtain back behind the chef's kitchen, you know, <laughs> you can see what they're doing. You know, I have to say 20 years ago, uh, people like Anthony Bourdain and, um, um, Alton Brown with the Good Eats program, they, uh, they did a lot to figuratively and literally blow the doors to the kitchen open and give you access uh, to show you what was really going on. It sort of had a, some uh, consequences, like chefs became personalities, and you, go, you can't go out to eat out anymore. Of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but really, the restaurants are still open. You can't go out to eat anymore without seeing some kind of open base set up where you can kind of see the flames coming up, lots of clanking behind there with pots and pans, and it's the, that spectacle is part of what we call dining out now. You know, it's a gastronomic experience. But on the um, on the sensory side of it, we know that we eat with these, these, and then this first, depending where you are in the house or the restaurant, but then it eventually gets passed here. Now, it's interesting. There's a big discussion over this right now in my, my career field over um, – how to sort of find balance between the biological imperative that we have to eat, which is to say nutrition, and then the fact that we eat for pleasure or what we might call entertainment, right? Um, we have pretty much most of us have the ability to shop for what we want to eat. And we know that, chefs know that. And when we create recipes, we create recipes that are based on sensory experiences that we love, okay? Now your taste buds, your wonderful taste buds can pick up five basic sensory experiences. You can pick up sweet, like honey, we can pick up salt, like sea salt, sour, like lemon, um, and then bitter. And bitter is an interesting one in the United States or in the Western Hemisphere because it's more prevalent in Asian cuisine. But in the, in the West, we tend to like bitter in the form of things like cocoa, right? We can appreciate cocoa. Let me take a little bit of that there. Okay. And then there's a fifth one called umami. And what umami is, is actually a sensitivity we have to glutamate. So glutamine and glutamate are amino acids. Glutamine is in the body and it kind of helps um, in the kidneys and intestines, but when it reacts with sodium atoms, it becomes glutamate. And glutamate is actually a neurotransmitter. It's actually the, the main neurotransmitter in our body, the most prevalent. And what it does is it helps our nervous systems getting signals from the brain to the rest of the body. Now we know that in the culinary world is monosodium glutamate and lots of people kind of frown upon that. But the truth is your body makes it and you get it out of products that have proteins like meat, uh, dairy, like cheese. Um, and so we perceive it as a sort of savory quality. And that's what umami means in Japan, in Japanese. So sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, okay? In the West, we tend to like to mix certain ones together to make recipes, sweet, salty, and sour like this lemon here, okay? But we try to harmonize them by creating a mixture and then balance that mixture to create wonderful recipes like Oh, I don't know, like a, a strawberry that has sweet and sour together that you might dip in the cocoa, something bitter, and you taste it, and it's just a whole different experience, right? And I love doing that. I love mixing berries with chocolate. We kind of did that last time I was on with you, and we're going to do that again today. Um, it's those, those mixtures or those sensory experiences create wonderful, um, wonderful recipes that we all enjoy. And then, of course, we know that there are differences between, say, the flavor of a banana and flavor of cheese, right? They taste different. And those are the results of little molecules called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. And I would say that most people know VOCs from like the paint. When you go to a Home Depot or a, a Lowe's and you're shopping for paint, you don't want to smell the, the fumes, the stinky fumes, and you want low VOC paint, right? Well, VOC means volatile organic compounds because these compounds break up pretty fast and then you don't perceive them the same way. Same thing happens. That's why a new car smell doesn't last, right? <laughs> I know. I wish it did, you know, but it doesn't. And then you're looking for an air freshener. Um, yeah, they're volatile. They break up eventually. And, um, but while you have them, 
Oh, by the way, just find ways to sort of keep that, to arrest that breakdown. Um, if you've ever heard some Southern chefs and cooking shows say the flavor's in the fat, it's because it kind of is. So what's happening is the volatile organic compounds and DOCs like in cheese are getting encapsulated by the lipids, the fat. And as a result, oops, here you go, you see? as a result, we're capturing those DOCs so that they slow down the breakdown um, because they're being encapsulated by other things. And lipids are great for that. So like a salad dressing or like a gravy, everybody says, oh, it tastes better the second day after it's in the fridge overnight. It's partially true because those organic compounds are moving through, but then they get encapsulated by the lipids. And the next time you eat that, when it coats your tongue, you've got some of that fat going across there, holding some of that in, and you get a longer flavor profile or experience. Interesting. Some things that we know back in the kitchen, you know, when we create recipes. So now you know. So, that's right. All right. So that's what we do. That's, that's kind of how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Chef, I love how... Um, for you, like there, there's always another layer, or like you know, like when we had the the Yelp Elite event, uh, the Yelp virtual event, and then you know people were asking questions, and like there, there there's no stumping chef Dave, right? Because you know it's like I mean, you make great tasting recipes, but you know the science behind it, and I think that that sets a great example for you know like the kids and the interns and stuff who are wanting to like you know get excited and put these pieces together, right? And get and get like a deeper understanding about food. Yeah, I and I will say like in the city of San Antonio, um, you know what? Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay. I, um, I have like sound popping in and out of my ears, but here, so I just want to make sure you can hear me. I have to say in the city of San Antonio, um, Museum Rail, you know, on Broadway, the main thoroughfare that kind of comes out of downtown and heads north to 410 uh, interstate. Um, you have all those museums, like the museum, you have the Witty Museum, and uh, they have their ACD Body Life Adventure there. Uh, the Botanical Garden has the outdoor kitchen kitchen, you know, and the edible garden. These are great resources in the city that really get into that. They, they talk about the, the sensory experience of food, but they also talk about nutrition and how your body, how it's in your body. And then they also talk about just the science, the, the molecular components to food that make it what it is for us. You know, as I mentioned, we have this nutritional, um, nutritional uh, dependency, but then we also choose what we eat for the pure pleasure of it. And we call that the gastronomic experience, you know, on the food side. But um, I would say foodies, foodies really get into it. And we have a lot of resources in the city that let you learn about it. Yeah, yeah. I know, well, I think, um, you know, one thing that parents sometimes as, as a challenge is when you have a picky eater, right? And that's like, as a parent, you wanna make sure your kids are getting the nutritional uh, requirements you know, but like for, you know, you also need to appeal to the gastronomic sense of your kids, right? And yeah. <laughs> and that's where like like getting them more involved, right? Could, could kind of open up their horizons a little bit. Um, but I think sometimes parents um, feel inhibited. Like they, they worry about like safety, right? Like, you know, um, you know, like my daughter wants to make pasta, but you know, she's a little nervous about turning on the gas burner, right? So she has me turn the burner on for her, um, you know, or like, um, you know, my son, I want, I wanted to cut a cucumber, but um, he's scared of the big chef's knife. He wants to use the paring knife. I'm like, no, it's really safer to use the chef's knife, but, um, you know, but we're still, so how do you recommend that like, parents learn to like relax a little bit and let their kids use, you know, a hot stove or use a knife and, you know, let kids build up those skills while they're at home and they can, you know, make mistakes with us. <laughs> sure. Okay. So a couple of things I picked up along the way in learning how to work with kids. And I'll tell you, I got into working with kids, uh, number one, because I just, uh, I, I was enamored by the kitchen when I was a kid. I don't know why, I guess I'm just built that way, but I grew up in a matriarchal family that let me play in the kitchen a lot. Um, so when I ever, whenever I create programming for kids, I really think back to when I was a kid and what I might have wanted, what would have been beneficial to me from an adult teaching me, um, based on what I know now. So I will tell you that, yes, you know, like I've got the standard eight inch chef, French style chef knife, right? And it has a, roll, a curved blade and you kind of rock and roll it. It's designed to do that. Um, but then there are Japanese knives that have a flat blade. And a lot of people from the very beginning, uh, you talk about apprehension. This is the thing that freaks people out the most, I think. The, the sharp blades, the knives. I don't know which one to use. I have this butcher block in the corner of my kitchen. I got it for Christmas eight years ago. I don't know what the knives do and I don't know which one to use for what, you know, I don't know. So it makes people very apprehensive. But the thing about it is 
um, I teach safety first because while cookie shells are popular and cooking is so pleasurable, it is so much fun when you finally, you know, understand how everything works, and you start paying, getting creative. Um, these are not toys, right? These are very, these are instruments and um, utensils and instruments and they, they demand a certain amount of healthy respect. So we start with that. All my programming always begins with three rules. Safety first is rule number one. And, you know, if, if I've ever had the pleasure of having any of your all kids in one of my program, we went over that first. Rule number one was safety first, right? Rule number two is keep it, is, is wash your hands. <laughs> you know, safety and sanitation all three things. Uh, and then rule number three is keep it clean. And I've seen a lot of kids and even grown ups that are trying to cut, but they don't take anything off their board. So they crowd the board and then they try to cut with like maybe one quarter of the board, you know, while they're trying to do maneuver around all the food. So we try to just get them thinking about safety fundamentals first. And once you have those down, it becomes less of a, of a, an, uh, an intimidating factor, if you will. Um, with the knives, I'm glad you brought that up though. Uh, we have worked, at least when I was doing programming at the Botanical Garden, I was working with kids down to five years old with real knives. And they do sell safety knives that are plastic, you know, the, uh, just a hard plastic, which is really good for soft things, but not good for something like a carrot or an onion. Um, and so it was necessary to actually use blades at one point. But yes, um, for most people, I would say from about nine years old, depending on the size of your child's hands and up, it's okay to use a full size knife. But honestly, if it makes it better for you, when we're talking about weight, I mean, which one of you is going to weigh more, right? It's okay to use yeah. a smaller knife. Um, use a knife that your hands can handle. And when we're talking about the little ones, uh, a three-inch paring knife is, is suitable as well, depending on what we're talking about, of course. But if you're cutting cheese cubes or you're cutting strawberries, you don't need the big old knife, you know? We can, we can start with this. What's more important is holding it properly, you know, as we mentioned in one of our previous classes, you hold it by the bolster with your thumb and forefinger, which is this little heavy metal piece right here between the blade and the handle, and you curl your fingers behind that. That puts you in a very good position to be able to control your knives. And with that kind of fundamental understanding, it's much easier to work with, you know? Yeah, yeah. I remember in the in the uh, another class that the the you, you talked about like the claw about like how to hold your fingers right like don't don't have your fingers sticking out yeah. but like you know pull your fingers in and uh, I showed my daughter that and now she's like she's much more confident about um, right because like like over the weekend we were practicing the um, the the fruit the uh, fruit, fruit screw year recipe and she was um, you know so, yeah so it, it's 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 working like these little tips right and it just takes it just takes practice and you know kind of working alongside and. You know, being there to help them, and and then they they get their confidence from it. They do. Confidence is a big thing. Uh, confidence puts you in a position to make much better decisions when you're in the kitchen. Uh, once you understand things and you have a healthy respect for them, you do things the right way. You you hold a skillet or you take a pot handle off with holding a towel. For, you know, you don't do it barehanded. Little things like that. By the way, that that actually comes into play like with something big. Um, like an apple. This is a big old honey crisp apple, right? It's as big as my hand and you think about it, as big as my fist. And so if I try to cut this with a big old knife and I'm trying to cut over, you know, I have to make the angle so steep that I have no real control over that. One of the reasons why they invented Santoku, um, a Santoku is meant to kind of do more of a sawing motion, which mm -hmm. makes complete sense when you're trying to break down something big. And the other hand, of course, is trying to stabilize everything you mentioned the law. You know, we don't want to have our fingers out while we're cutting because that just doesn't go in well for anybody, right? So we, we curl our fingers this way with our fingertips underneath because number one, downward pressure stabilizes something, especially if it's kind of rounded. Um, we actually teach the kids to slice through the bottom of an apple uh, if it's rounded because the second you create a plane there, it's stable, you know, real basic. And then you curl your fingers around it so you, do nev you never have to worry about them getting clipped. And you, and you kind of put a little bit of downward pressure with your claw, which makes make sure that that's not going anywhere, anywhere. Then you can simply slice through your apple without any kind of resistance, really. Nice clean cut, and you know, fingers are safe, and it works much better that way. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And there, uh, you mentioned like there are. Now. Huh? 
Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, these are sort of the charter school connection. Like you mentioned, schools like Idea that have um, you know gardens at their schools. But um, actually, yeah. I saw a picture on social media today from a school called The Gathering Place, and they're letting kindergartners use use knives to cut their their food. And it, I was really happy to see that because it it just you know it's it's real life skills and it builds their confidence. Yeah, you know, I I, I forgot where I was watching it, but. I think it was YouTube and I saw these little kids that were playing violins like virtuosos and they were tiny, they were five years old. And I thought, how is somebody that little able to do something that I couldn't do at 46 years old, you know? Um, and the truth is the, you know, you teach them at the level that they can learn, but even a child that small, I would argue, can, can understand the basic, basics of safety and mechanics of course the more ta the more play they get oh that was another thing in the um the more play they get the more tactile sensory experience they get especially out in the garden the more they understand what this is we used to we used to joke because parents would tell me my kid will not eat zucchini but he will eat his zucchini and i and i had to ask myself what is she saying what she means and it's because i had her her kiddo out her fourth grader out in the garden had never really eaten the zucchini before I let him harvest a couple of zucchinis that were in harvest. And he had one in his hand that he had pulled off the plant. He had a relationship established with that veggie. Then he was more curious and more inclined to want to taste it. Uh, idea and, and the gathering place and um, things like that are really good about creating opportunities for students to go out there and start developing those relationships. Uh, very, very important. The food bank, the San Antonio Food Bank has their outdoor garden also. And they will allow you to come do that. And of course, we're in a pandemic right now, but I believe even like Safety, you know, they have the after school programs and I believe they're going to have a culinary program. They're all designed to sort of supplement or augment the schools uh, who are teaching this kind of relationship or fostering this kind of relationship. I think that's amazing, uh, especially from yeah. the perspective of nutrition, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's really exciting for me. I'm really, I'm I'm proud of what's happening in San Antonio, like in spite of in spite of the pandemic. Well, but um, okay. Should we should we dive into some recipes? I know you've got the apple, you've got the apple right there. <laughs> I started. I started cutting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Oh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in this. I'm gonna show people on the blog like what um mm. what we've got and yeah. let's see. Let me find. Let's see. Oh yeah, and. So like the, this is the recipe for the, this is what happens to the apples, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, I, just, I, yeah. <laughs> I want to encourage everybody like you can do this at home and you can do it with your kids. And we've got um, yeah. all the instructions on the blog. So, okay, I will, I will hide the website now and we will go oh. back to, to Chef Dave. In fact, I can, I can full screen you if that helps to. Uh, what, whatever you like, you know, that works too. whatever you like to do. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. So, uh, as Inga mentioned, you know, the recipes were designed to be really simple and easy for, for parents and their kiddos to follow. And what I have is a couple of healthy uh, treats that we created for, for the San Antonio Charter Moms uh, website. And one of them is uh, little monster faces that we use, that we make out of apples. So, as I mentioned, I cut that side of the apple clean through. Hey, you can kind of see that better. Um, we call these cheeks, and I'm going to cut the other one off because to make this particular treat, you cut the cheeks of the apples off, and then you end up with like this sort of middle part that has the core. We'll cut those off as well. And this is really easy for the kids to do because it involves very few cuts, but you're also cutting through something, an apple that's semi-firm, um, firm enough to make clean cuts and teach the mechanics of cutting, but not so hard that it would create uh, big problems for the kiddo. So once I remove the core, I have two of these cheeks and then two of these smaller pieces. And what this recipe does is create six of these little monster mouths. And so I'll, I'll start with these little pieces first. This piece right here can be cut in half or even four pieces if it's a, if it's a really big apple like this one. But the idea is to create kind of like a mouth, like lips. And so I cut that in half lengthwise and you can kind of see our little lips right here. That's going to be our lip. And I'll show you two of these. Um, and cut them together. Okay. So let's pull this back so you can see. Look, I'm going to try to change the camera angle just a little bit so you can see better. There we go. 
Okay, so I've got my, my apple mouse. What I do is I take a little bit of peanut butter and it's going to create kind of a glue to hold everything together. And I'm going to take about a quarter teaspoon and I'm going to put it in between the two lips. It should bond or adhere to the, to the inside of the apple pretty easy. And you press down gently to kind of hold them in place. Okay. And if you forget to start there, you can just kind of scoop it off your spoon. I use smooth peanut butter. I would not recommend doing this with chunky peanut butter. There's too much that can go wrong with all those little hard pieces. Um, there we go. And I'm going to kind of pull that strawberry back from my example earlier. Because what I'm going to do with the strawberry is I'm going to de-stem the strawberry. And then I'm going to cut the strawberry into small slices, thin slices, because that creates kind of like a tongue shape. And we're going to stick those tongues right in our apple, in our lip. Okay. So you lift up and you kind of press, push the tongue, the, the strawberry slice in there slightly, just like this. It kind of looks like a tongue going, uh, you know. A lot of fun there. There we go. All right. Now, I use almonds. Um, you can use marshmallows, like mini marshmallows, just like these. If you want to make teeth and you and you have like a tree nut allergy in the house, okay. But if you don't, if you can use nuts, I like the little uh, blanched livered almonds, okay. So something like this. I'll hold it up to the camera so you can see. And the reason for that is because they all come out kind of asymmetrical, and they look kind of like jagged little thingy teeth. And so what what I do is I take the apple slices held together with the peanut butter and I press down over that strawberry tongue a little firm and what it does is it pushes some of that uh, peanut butter forward and I just kind of stick my my almond sliver in there to make them look like fangs. Okay. Oops, I'm popping out there. And if you just if you need a little more just grab a little grab your spoon that has the peanut butter like I need right now and you just stick them in there. And you start making fangs. You all see that? Okay. And I'll take a little bit more. And I'll put like incisors, the incisors on top of the tongue. So it looks like the teeth are sticking down. Oops. I'm just a bundle or nurse. They had a hard time. I, I have to admit, Inga, I was watching The Mandalorian right before we started this. And so I'm all excited. Here we go. There you go. I'm going to sell you. I think I think you can you can hear me now. I, I think I removed myself from the stream, but yeah, I'm really excited about oh. watching the Mandalorian. We've got some we've got some Star Wars fans over here too. Oh gosh, I grew up on Star Wars. It came I think the first movie came out in 1977. I was just a little guy, and you know, I just I've been hooked ever since. It's just fun, and the imagination gets going, and uh, just like now, I'm probably able to do this because of my imagination. So you have little teeth going on, <laughs> and now we have to make eyes for our little monster mouth. And what I do is I take mini marshmallows. Oh my gosh, Inga, I went to the store yesterday to buy marshmallows and had a hard time finding some. And I think oh, it's no. because, I know, I think it's because they got cold here in Texas and everybody decided to go do s'mores in the backyard. Uh, but a friend, oh. of mine mentioned, a friend of mine mentioned that she thinks it's because Halloween, a lot of people are in fact gonna stay in. And they're going to do stuff, fun stuff at home. So they do. Okay. Right. Well, to make my eyes, I'm going to take two little mini marshmallows, and I'm going to take just a little bit of that peanut butter. Okay. And I'm going to press them together using that peanut butter as a glue. Uh -huh. Okay. They already look funny. <laughs> they what? They yeah, already look look silly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love silly. Okay, now I bought mini mar mini chocolate chips. Okay, and you know when you have a chocolate chip, it's because they're they're basically taking melted chocolate and, and dropping dots. And Great. the top of the chocolate chip is going to be pointy. So all you're going to do is invert that pointy part and push it into each marshmallow. And what that does for you is it makes like googly eyes. <laughs> it's like oh. a little it's like a little chocolate thumbtack. That's what it is. That's what it feels like. So there are my googly eyes. Oh, gotta get them. 
and and this happens sometimes. I notice like if you let the marshmallows dry out just a little bit, let them sit out for a little bit, they they they're a little more firm and they tend to hold the mar the chocolate chips better. But you can use a little bit of uh, peanut butter, like a glue. Once again, as a glue, and it makes it just oh, enough yeah. tackiness to hold them in. <laughs> Those and, are hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just a little bit more peanut butter on top of the apple now. So uh, everything is about holding it together. I'm just going to take a little bit, put it on top of the apple, move the peanut butter out of the camera view, and then I take my uh, my little eyes and I put them on top. <laughs> my little rude monster nails, right? <laughs> And the cool thing about it is because, you know, you have such a variable in the way the cuts are going to come out with your, your little strawberry tongues and the, the almond slivers that you use. They all just come out looking a little bit different, but they're a lot of fun to do. <laughs> and you put a, you put like 15 of these on a platter for the kids and they just go nuts over it, you know. Um, if you can't, if you can't have tree nuts, uh, you could also replace the, the little nut slivers in there with the mini marshmallows to make like teeth. Just like you know, little softer round teeth, um, <laughs> and then to, if you can't have almond or nut or like a peanut butter, you can also use sunflower butter. It makes a suitable alternative oh, yeah. as a butter, yeah. and it has the same tackiness. I do not recommend tahini because tahini is just too soft, too runny. Oh, too runny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but sunflower is perfect for that. So there Let's you go. Just go <laughs> <laughs> those are so funny you know and then you never know like if you get kids involved with making the recipes like you know if they might add antenna or you know little arms or you never know right <laughs> yeah let's see there we go so one thing you can do is um they're great for themselves like this but if you want to add a little bit of a dipping sauce it's real easy just to take a little bit of yogurt greek yogurt i like greek yogurt because Greek yogurt removes 35 to 40% of the water in the way out of regular yogurt. And, you know, um, you definitely want to get rid of that. Like, for example, I have about a half full tub of Greek yogurt. And even after getting into it, you can still see that there's water that comes out of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It settles. Yeah. yeah. Left, of course, it's much firmer. Um, and I like that because it makes it much easier to make uh, mixers that, like a dip that has different flavor elements. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a sweet one by taking about for, for, you know, for six to 10 of these, about half a cup to three quarters of a cup of Greek yogurt. And Greek yogurt looks kind of chalky because it's so that water removed, right? And wow. Um, so it's funny why you, you don't actually, you don't actually use a measuring cup. Whereas my daughter and I were all like, had our like pampered chef, like, you know, measure cup. <laughs> Oh, the chef's to try to get a chef to follow an actual recipe in a book is pretty <laughs> challenging in this because well we we've, we've made a few things and we know how we like to play and you know put a book in front of me I I don't know what to do no I know what to do with it but you know how it is. <laughs> but yeah I kind of I can eyeball pretty much so I, I know I have about three quarters of a cup and I'm going to take a couple of drops. Oops. Uh oh. Let's see if we can bring Chef Dave back. Hang on a sec, folks. Let's see. I'll show you the recipe for a minute. Let's see. Oh, he's back. Uh -oh. Hey, welcome back. That's okay. Sorry I just, about I that. The I don't know what happened. <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna scroll you again. Yes, this is the joy of technology. It's it's 2020. Yeah. We've always we've all experienced <laughs> like meeting ourselves at the wrong time. All right, welcome back. 330 Americans trying to stay home right now, and you do everything online. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so yeah. you put the vanilla in, right? Yep, I have a couple of drops of vanilla. Remember, because I'm using grape okay. yogurt that has taken a lot of the water out, I can add some back in without ending up with a big running mess, right? Yeah, and you know that. Yeah. You know it's going to be a liquid. Um, I have honey right here. So I'm going to take about a mm. tablespoon or so and add it to that. Really, I'm using meadow foam honey. Have you ever heard of meadow foam honey? No. Meadow foam is um, it's a flower, a little white flower that grows in the Pacific North, 
west along the waterway. An interesting thing about oh, meadow wow. foam honey, if you can find it, um, is that it tastes like uh, toasted marshmallows. So if you can Ooh. find it, it's a great, great, great honey to find. Wow. There we go. Yeah. All right. So I've got my honey there. Okay. And then I can I can add different things to it to flavor it. Um, if you can't use honey, like you have really, really little ones, you can use maple syrup. Uh, it has a good consistency that works. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of cinnamon. Just a, a couple of sprinkles of cinnamon, and I'm going to kind of mix this up. Okay. And the honey will actually take the chalkiness, the chalky appearance of Greek yogurt, and turn it into a very glossy, silky looking dip. Mm. Um, yeah, and so it's much funner, you know, much more fun to, to look at and glossy. Yeah. And, and once I have that really simple, easy dip, just a little bit of honey, a little bit of cinnamon, um, and my yogurt, I can then kind of scoop it out. That's all it does. It took me all 15 seconds to make. And I can <laughs> kind of add it to a little bowl for my kiddos, you know, and then serve that on a plate or a platter, or you, know, you could do a big board, like a charcuterie board, with my little monster mouth. And that's just such an easy <laughs> little Halloween-y kind of thing to do, you know? That's fantastic. It's really easy. And it's on your website, so if they want to know how they can make it, and if they follow, want to follow a recipe, it's right there for them. Yeah. Well, um, now, Chef Dave, are you, up for, oh, are you up for another recipe? Because I'd love to see yeah, some more. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Okay, so, you know, Halloween, everybody thinks candy, 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 sugar, sugar, sugar. Well, we got to put something healthy in the kiddos that can't just be sweet, right? So we want to we want to think about savory things that are fun to work with, too. So just really quick, I have some skewers that, uh, that you can also put on the board next to all your fun little uh, sweet treats, like your little monster mouth. I have these little six-inch uh, bamboo skewers, okay? I actually had long ones that I just kind of cut in half. Uh, and you can blunt the ends, take some scissors and blunt the ends of them. You've got little ones that you don't want to, you know, risk uh, poking yourself with. And so what I have is I have gray tomatoes. I have black olives, about the same size. So I went and bought jumbo, jumbo olives, black olives. And then mm. just like the cheese I showed you earlier, I have just some cheddar Colby, uh, Colby uh, Jack cheese cube because they're kind of orange and white. And I thought, hey, black and orange, great for Halloween, right? So yeah. all you have to do is take a skewer and take one of your cheese cubes and press through. Um, because these are kind of spongy, it's going to stick to your skewer pretty well. And so then you can take a, like a tomato and run it through. Uh, mm -hmm. Take another cheese cube and an olive. Of course, olive being, um, I use the pitted olives, you're going to need to hold something put something there to hold it in place and so i kind of put three pieces or so to just like this real simple skewer okay <laughs> and i'll do another one because um for you grown-ups now the kids will eat them like this is fine if they see the cheese you show kid cheese they're gonna go for it right but um mm -hmm. you can elevate these too if you're doing a party like a halloween party and you got family coming over uh you can elevate them a little bit and i'll show you how in just a second so let me Get my last piece of cheese on this skewer. Okay, and I'll move these out of the way. There we go. And I just kind of serve them crisscross. You, know, you mentioned about that we eat we eat with our eyes, our you know, our nose yeah. and then our mouth. And the con the color contrast, you know, is that's how we eat with our eyes, right? It's true. Isn't that fun? So like like kind of doing a crisscross too, we break the we, we like to break the plane. Let me, let me show you what I mean real quick. Um, my cutting board here runs, has bamboo. Um, it's pretty much compressed bamboo flat, right? It makes a pretty pattern. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Here, I'll show you the clean side because I had a, a strawberry go all over the place there. Um, <laughs> you don't necessarily stir food but it's oriented the same way. So like if I have horizontal lines like this, I probably would not place a skewer running horizontal. I would uh. it at an angle to break the plane. And for some reason, yeah. our eyes we just really appreciate that better. You know, like if, when you go to a restaurant and you get served like a, an appetizer on a plate, you'll notice right. the plating is done to sort of break the point. Okay. There's another little secret there from the restaurant. <laughs> okay. Now I mentioned, how can you elevate something like this? Well, 
you could take a little bit of uh, minced garlic, a little bit of olive oil, mm -hmm. just a little bit, and you can take something like dill, okay, and add that in there. And then you kind of stir it up, and it just makes something that you can lightly coat on top of your cheese skewers. The cheddar and the dill actually work nicely together, as does the garlic. And you can add a little black pepper as well. And you just kind of sprinkle it on top and take a paste brush and brush it. What was that? I'm just imagining how that smells. Like, I love the smell of garlic when you crush it. And it just, like, oh, it just fills all your spaces. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. Um, you can take some of that dried garlic or, or even chopped garlic at the very end and sprinkle it on top. Get some green on there. Green's always a little nice, right? And voila, you have something just a little bit more elevated, a little more, more fun to eat. You can throw, you know, half, uh, a dozen or even two dozen of these on a platter, and they look fantastic. Um, and there you go. You've got some savory Halloween treats that can go along with the sweet stuff. Sweet can be healthy as well as we saw in the last recipe. Um, and it doesn't just all have to be candy. And if you're staying home this holiday season or you just want something healthy and the kiddos to go with all that candy, uh, there are great easy ways to do that. Yeah, yeah. And there's and there's so much more, but we just don't want to take all, all the time to demonstrate all the recipes. But like there's what my daughter calls the boo nanas, right? <laughs> Which are the banana bananas? Girls, right? <laughs> but there's, you want to do those yeah. real quick? Do we have a minute? Yeah, let's do those. Let's do those. My daughter loves those. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, especially for the little ones. Sometimes these things can be a little bit above the, the abilities of your really little ones. So take a banana. Real easy to take your to make bananas out of your <laughs> beautiful ripe bananas. All you have to do is take a small knife. You can even get the little kids to break them in half. Just you know, literally break them in half. I'm going to cut mine. So real simple to do. I'm going to take my chocolate chip, my mini chocolate chip, and you're going to need three per banana. Okay, because you're essentially making mouths and eyes out of them. You're really just going to make the, the boo face, right? So what I do is I take a skewer. Now, I mentioned blunting the skewers. Don't use a sharp side in a banana because, number one, if your little ones are trying to eat, that could create a hazard. But also, if you have a sharp one, there's a tendency for the banana to keep sliding and fall all the way down, and, and uh, it keeps going. So if you use the blunted in and only go in about halfway, the stick will hold the banana in place, okay? So you invert those little mini chocolate chips like we did with the marshmallow and you push two of them in for eyes and one for a mouth. And that is all you have to do, Boonana. <laughs> you can melt some chocolate in the microwave and dip them in there for a quick you know, treat. But look how easy that is. What five-year-old probably couldn't master that in about three minutes? Uh, and you look yeah. fantastic on the platter next year. Little root apple, so your little mountain of apple. Where did I put that mountain of apple? There you go. The same dip. You know, you can dip the bananas in there. There you go. Easy Halloween treat. Right? <laughs> Fast, easy, healthy, and tasty. Those are hilarious. Yeah. Right. No, and they're and it's fruit. I mean, they're going to eat fruit on Halloween instead of candy, right? I mean, they can eat. They can have both, right? But it it just adds some balance in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have both. I don't know what it is about these things. Everybody who sees these things just starts cracking up. I don't know what it is about the bananas, but <laughs> I can't go anywhere and make these without somebody cracking up about them. But... <laughs> yeah, I guess one one tip you said about the bananas um, on the on the other show was um, to do them at the last minute because they will start to turn brown, right? The, the yeah, apples and will. bananas. In fact. I said that so the, that's the thing about apples and bananas. They oxidize if you take the peels off, right, or expose them. Yeah, these are going to be something that's so fresh and pretty much right before, or you serve it right after you make it. Um, so if you're doing it as an activity, I highly recommend it become a focal activity, a focal point kind of activity where everybody gathers around the table or what have you, and they make them, and then you just enjoy them right after you make them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, that ties back into, you know, what, what you started us with, which is, you know, growing up in El Paso in a family, you know, like with powerful women around, you know, and everything's happening in the kitchen and, you know, yeah. all the generations want to be a part of it. And that's how, and that's how foodways are passed on, right? Yeah, yeah. I have to tell you, the very first thing that I ever, I, I was ever enamored by that I could not get out of my head is uh, my godmother um, was in my grandmother's kitchen and they were making tortillas. And they were making uh, flour tortillas 
and I couldn't figure out how she knew by her. You talk about not following the recipe. She knew by hand <laughs> how, how much to pinch off of the dough to roll into the perfect size tortilla. And you let them sit a little bit before you roll them. She would press them out with her rolling pin, and she would throw them on the griddle, and then she would press them to bubble the form. And she used to say that she would make them cry, and I used to just die laughing, you know, because she would do that on purpose just for me. And it's those <laughs> memories that they, they, they anchor you, and, um, you know, uh, they remind you of great times that you can always go back to and reminisce about. Um, and I noticed that a lot of my favorite foods have some kind of emotional anchor put back to the past somewhere, you know? Yeah. So that can I think be part of what positive. I love so I think part of what I love so much about fruit is that, so I was actually born in California because I, you were teasing me about that the other day. Sometimes people, I've lived in Texas for 30 years, but I was born in California oh. and my grandfather had a big backyard um, with all kinds of fruit trees. And we, you know, in Southern California, you can grow everything. And so we, we did, we do what we call the eating tour, which is like, Hey, are the apricots ripe? Okay. Just grab one, pop it in, spit the seed on the ground, you know, and just, and just, you know, fresh figs, plums, oh. you know, uh, yeah. quads, you know, just all kinds of stuff growing all over his backyard. And and so like that that connection with how fruit really grows, you know, it just got ingrained in me from a or like my grandmother had lemon trees and limes and tangerines and um my uncle had a pomelo, right? That's that's kind of a weird one, you know. <laughs> Takes some work to get at it, but it's good stuff. Oh, a pomelo yeah, really. vine? What's that? Oh, I was just gonna ask you, where did you grow up? Oh, we're in uh, Southern California. So um, let's see, I was living in, we have a grandmother in Coronado, right? She's right on the coast. And so lots of, lots of citrus there. Um, you know, we had problems with mildew in our garden because it was so moist and cool all the time. So we had to be strategic about, about that. And then my, um, my grandfather and my uncle lived in the uh, um, San Fernando Valley. So that's a little bit hotter, drier part of Southern California, not quite as coastal and just really great for, um, uh, the fruit trees and it had they had enough chill hours that they could do like the stone fruits and you know get them wow. to to you know produce really well so yeah and then my dad grew up um in the northern central valley of california and they would like his summer job was picking prunes so that's why i never got to complain about you know being uncomfortable or too hot or working too hard because my dad's like yeah well you don't have to pick prunes <laughs> yeah really that is um I'll, I'll tell you what, um, one of the things that I love about Campus Garden, especially like uh, what the charter schools are doing, is that they they do get the kids out there picking and the kids do understand what it takes to get that food from the plant or tree or shrub to your plate. Um, and I think that respect will only serve us well. Uh, it will certainly serve them well later uh, because they have, it's not just one thing to appreciate food because it tastes good. Uh, I think it's part of our value system and our culture, you know, and if we can improve our culture by by teaching them early to value where the food actually comes from and what it takes to get it, um, I think we start to eliminate we start to eliminate things like waste. Um, we we make better choices in what we're going to choose to eat, um, you know, and, and a lot of positive things that will change as a result of that experience. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we can we can tap into our experiences and our memories. We can we can teach kids this this knowledge. You know, everything from picking up a knife to knowing how much work it takes to get you know those peas or that okra, or and then and mm -hmm. and understanding the how precious food is and the value of work and the dignity of the work that it takes to make uh, to make the food right and appreciate our farmers and and our chefs and and what they what they bring to make our lives richer. Yeah, I mean, we were, I was looking at the No Kid Hungry website this morning, and I saw that, uh, you know, there are statistics that say something like one in six kids may be food insecure in the United States. And because of the pandemic, um, that number may get worse. Uh, and so it's just one of the things that makes you realize uh, there are a lot of kids who are, are food insecure, which means they don't have food that is nutritionally dense enough, even if they get enough food, to, to really give them what they need for their nutritional needs. Um, so you have that issue already, but I would hazard a guess and say a lot of kids who are food secure, insecure already probably don't have access to a, a garden where they can have that experience or, you know, a grove of trees that are producing fruit where they can have that experience. Um, so I think the more that any kind of educational institutions do that to create that experience for the kids, the better. 
because I mean, yeah. we're talking about uh, a, a literacy uh, that results from that interaction you know, or that experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great segue because I want to encourage this. Is, this is a, we always close out with the call to action, which is encouraging people to, um, you know, it goes live tomorrow, November 1st, right? So when most people are watching this video, the site will be live and they can um, they can go visit foodieclassroom.com and they can see these um, modules that you have, right? The videos and um, you said it ties in with math and science. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see, I've, I've gotten kind of a glimpse of it, but I'm excited to, to, to see the site as it goes live. And um, I just I really encourage everybody to, you know, visit it and use it and spread the word about it. Yeah, so here's a big grid paper here. We're gonna teach how to do some algebra with blueberries in a grid like this. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. So cool. And then we'll come up with something tasty to do with blueberries. So that's awesome. That's what we'll do, right? My son's in eighth grade. He's taking algebra like this year. So I, that's we'll probably try that one first. <laughs> yeah, I realized that algebra is not in the middle schools. It's not in the high. It's not ninth grade anymore. It's much earlier and. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I really like that. Yeah. We use algebra our entire lives, whether we know it or not, you know? That's right. And you that's definitely, right. if you're going to scale up a recipe, you are absolutely using algebra. So uh, yeah. anything like ratios, you know, how much of the flour goes in there compared to the sugar, you know, those ratios and percentages, those are, fat, are something that you use algebra to figure out, uh, especially when the, you know, cake doesn't come out right. You want to go back and figure out what went wrong. So. You know. <laughs> That's right. I, I credit baking with helping me get fractions. I always did well on fractions in math. <laughs> and I did a lot of baking. <laughs> yes, most definitely. Awesome. Um, we're okay. gonna teach, uh, in fact, we're going to teach fractions with uh, a vinaigrette, a salad dressing. And in fact, Ooh. it's the recipe that we put, we put on your website. On the, oh, it's the, the bruschetta from, from the summer. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. That, uh -huh. Delicious. Uh -huh. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I love it. Fractions with bruschetta and vinaigrette. Okay. Yeah. And it's an emulsion, right? So you learn about colloidal suspensions and chemistry, right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm I'm super excited to I'll pop it up there one, one more time on the screen, foodieclassroom.com. And um, I'm, I'm looking for, I hope we can have you back on the show again sometime uh, Chef Dave with some more recipes and this has been wonderful and I hope it helps families to you know have a, like a healthy and safe and fun uh, Halloween experience. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it Inga. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>